save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for the labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Oh, rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. All right, Ella Narlin has something to say before Ella Jackson comes up. Well, we see that this camp meeting has been a tremendous blessing to you all. Amen? Amen. And we're thankful that this year we're seeing a lot of new faces as well. And people have been sharing personal testimonies of how God has been just blessing them tremendously in a mighty and marked manner. So we're grateful for all of our attendees and, and also for the remnant that remains. Amen? Amen? The Bible says the remnant remains until the end. So we're grateful for those who have stayed behind. I just want to give a report. Um, this morning we collected an offering. And praise God, we have uh, so far received uh, $9,533.40. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And that's the good news. The bad news is not what we were asking for. <laughs> <laughs> that is close to covering the expenses for the camp meeting without even touching the other things that the Lord has put before us. So what we're going to do this, this evening is we're going to ask you to prayfully just dig a little bit deeper and prayfully ask God if there's something else that you could do to help out the mission here. So I'm going to pray, and the deacons are going to come forward, and then we're going to collect another offering by God's grace to get us a little bit closer to the budget that we have for the camp meeting. So let us pray together. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you're the God that gives all things, and we're thankful, Lord, that you even gave your life for us. And love is manifested in giving. And the two most valuable things that you could give in this world is your life and also your time. But you also ask, Lord, that we support the cause. We support the work. So for this reason, Father, we are praying once again, as you know, the expenses of the camp meeting and the other projects that we have, Lord, that we know will be a blessing to this community and ultimately to your cause in the world. We just pray that we'll see what God's people can do more, Lord, to dig a little bit deeper into their pockets and also in their hearts, as the statement says, to get, a little, get us a little closer to our budget. So bless the offering in advance, and we thank you for what you will do. Again, we also pray for Brother Jackson, who will come up and speak to us. Give us a message, Lord, that we need right now. And I see the title, Lord, a servant of servants. And may we truly have that experience to be a servant of servants, like Jesus. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, the ways that you could give, if you want to give a check, you can write it out to Red River Outpost. And again, if you need a tax deduction, you can raise your hand, you can get an envelope, and the deacons will give you an envelope. And please write your name, your address, and your contact information so that we can get your tax deductible receipt to you before year ends. So God bless these other ways that you can give. If you want to give Zell, PayPal, or Cash App is info at Red River Outpost. Info at Red River Outpost. You can also go directly to our website, redriveroutpost.org forward slash donate, or you can scan the QR code. And we're also grateful for those who have given online. We have received quite a few donations online as well. Well, thank you all. We know that you'll do the very best you can to help the cause. Amen. May God bless you. Uh, is that, is that, yes, yes, info at Red River Outpost. Yes, dollar sign Red River Outpost, yes, thank you.
There shall be showers of blood. Precious reviving again. Precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valley. Sound of abundance of rain. Sound of abundance of rain. Shouted showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercies wrap around us of falling. But for the showers we plead. They shall be showered. Send them upon us, O Lord. Send them, 195. O Lord, grant to us now a refreshing. Us now a refresh. Come and now honor thy word. Honor thy word. Sing it showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercies wrap around us so falling, but for the showers we plead, they shall be showers. Oh, that today they might fall. Oh, that today they might fall. Now, as to God, we're confessing. God, we confess. Now, as on Jesus, we call. Jesus we call, shout it, showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need, mercy drop around us all falling, but for the showers we And one last announcement, as Brother Jackson is coming up, our market will be open tonight. For I know many are probably not going to be able to make it in the morning and meet ministry as well as uh, the Sandoval New Paradigm Ministries and all the ministries represented here. They have materials that could be a, a great resource to you. It was also a blessing to the ministries to help to support the causes as well. Just want to let you know that our market will be open tonight. Mic check. It's on. All right, we're glad to see some favorite few, such as myself. It's been a high day, would you say so? Let's have another word of prayer, and as God navigates us through the scriptures here, we want to hear what He has to say to us. I'm going to kneel. You bow your heads or kneel with me. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we come once again into Thy presence. In the name of Thy Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For, Lord, you are worthy to be praised. You are infinite in your love, your mercy, your forgiveness, your grace. And now, Lord, we need wisdom. We need understanding. We do not want just information for information's sake. We want information for transformation, that we might live a life that would bring honor and glory to your name. Now, bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Let your angels be in this tent as we close out these Sabbath hours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God be the glory. We'll go to the screen, and we're going to talk about servants of servants. You see the scripture up there? Come from John chapter 13, verse 1 through 17. So let's take our Bibles there. And many of us who are students of the Word of God have read this text John chapter 13, servant of servant. Throughout the camp meeting, when we talk about the time and the work, God is calling for servants. He says to us that the harvest is plenteous, but the labor are what? Few. And therefore, he said, pray to the Lord of the harvest he will send forth laborers. It's one thing that I have learned, well, one of the many things I've learned within seven years in this work for 45 years. 
for the first 38 years in the work and the ministry been in existence for 34 years, we look for help. We look for help, servants, to be part of the ministry. So we advertise help, advertise. We get responses, responses. And I remember the son, Narlin, said, if you're really looking for, what you mean, that nine to five, what kind of job that is? If you're looking for what? You're looking for an easy route. You might as well get a nine to five. Now, there's three levels of work. That's what you call lay, conference, and self-supporting work. Those are the three areas in which we can do the work. When it speaks of lay, that encompasses all of God's people, individual. Each one of us have a mission. Would you say so? Then you can be workers for the conference, pay workers for the conference. Then you can get into a work such as this. Instead of self-supporting, I God called God called it God-supported work, and that self-supporting God-supported work is a whole different creature. And many folks say, "I want to start a ministry, want to get into the work," and I think they have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. So we really need to investigate that. But nevertheless, each one of us are called to do a work for the Lord. So in John chapter 13, you look at verse 1 through 17, and we see here that Jesus, at the place of foot washing, you remember the scene, the basin, the water was ready, towel, and no one moved to wash feet. Hmm? You read that in the whole text of 1 through 17. Then Jesus got up, took off his outer garment and girded himself, put a towel there, and he began to wash feet. Now, what was the reaction of the disciples when they saw Jesus washing the feet? What was their reaction? They were shocked. Why did they shock? He was the master. If he is the savior, what is the savior and the master doing such of a insignificant common situation? And we know the story because he said, I left unto you example. And so servant of servant. So let's look at this for a moment. Now our God is a servant God. Very interesting to know that. Our God is a servant God. Statement here from Norman. It says in the book, A Reflection of the Christian Life. It says, Our God is a serving God. It is difficult for us to uh, understand that we are liberated by someone who became powerless, that we are being strengthened by someone who became weak, that we find new hope in someone who. Uh, who divested himself of all distinction, and that we find a leader in someone who became a servant, just the opposite of what we view. Do we understand that statement? Therefore, we find in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 9, we talk about even the mind of Christ, that Christ humbled himself, became a servant. Keep that in mind, the very mind of Christ became a servant. As a young boy, James Irvin often pointed to the moon and told anyone who would listen that someday he would travel there. It's doubtful anyone believed him because space travel was still found only in science fiction tales. Hmm? But Colonel James B. Irvin Live to see his childhood dream become a reality. When he was a member of the Apollo 15 crew that made the successful moon walk. Anybody was living during that time? (laughs) 
He spoke of the thrill connected with leaving this planet, seeing it shrink in size. He mentioned watching Earth rise one day and thinking how privileged he was to be a member of that unique crew. Unique crew. So, go, go forward here. Let's go back. As he was returning to earth, he said, I realized that I was a servant, not a celebrity. So I'm here as God's servant on planet earth to share what I have experienced that others might know the glory of God. All the accolades, he realized he was not a celebrity. It was dawned on him he was a servant. So God allowed Colonel Irvin to discover a basic truth about Christ-likeness. We are called to be his servants. Called to be his servants. Serve one another. Here's a wonderful statement. Because you and I do not have to have a ministry like this, a ministry like uh, meat ministry or what Dr. Mark, being a pastor of a church. Listen to this statement here. The spiritual life of the church can be kept alive only by its members make what? Person effort to win souls to Christ. James Wesley had this statement. He stated that we have one business upon this earth, and that business is to win souls for Jesus. When Tabitha stood up here, and I always say to the staff, to the students, the success of any ministry, the success of life, the success of the church, the success of family is measured by a soul won to Christ. Tabitha standing here is a manifestation that Red River Ministry is valid. You can have all the wherewithal the buildings, the technology, all the creativity of a wonderful staff, all intact, showing the praises of God, glory, campus, pristine, but if not a soul won to Christ, all that burns. It's a miss. Anybody listen to that? Success is measure. By a soul won to Christ. A ministry, I don't care what it is, is not successful if no one is won to Christ. Keep that in mind. Very important to understand that. Therefore, Christ is our example. In ministry on page 17, a very familiar text we read over and over again. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to this world as the unwearied servant of man's necessity. He took our infirmities and bare our sickness, that he might minister to every need of humanity, Matthew 8, 17. It says here, the burden of disease and wretchedness and sin he came to remove. It was his mission to bring to men complete restoration, complete restoration. He defines that completeness as such. He came to give them health, physical, peace, mental, perfection of character, spiritually. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 5, love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your might, with all of your strength. Physical, mental, and physical. Jesus said, will thou be made whole? You read in Matthew, I believe it's Matthew 9. They brought a man that was sick of the palsy. The first, Jesus, first thing Jesus said to the man's son, be a good cheer or good courage. That's dealing with the mental disposition. Then he said, thy sins be forgiven thee. That's dealing with the spiritual dimension. Then he said, pick up that bed and walk. Ministry like this and other ministry in the Advent movement must address the whole person. You cannot departmentalize. I remember growing up, 
I was born in Alabama, grew up in Chicago. I remember at the age of four, I used to look out that little shotgun house watching my mother in the chicken coop. Chasing chicken around the chicken pen, grabbing the chicken and wringing his neck. <laughs> Taking the chicken to the chopping block. Taking an axe. Come down on the neck. The body falls one way. The head falls another way. But the body is still moving. Still moving around the coop. Bouncing into the fence. Bouncing everywhere until he just falls dead. And I remember growing up in Chicago and I'm getting into crazy stuff. She said, son, you run around here like a chicken with your neck cut off. You understand that? You're not using your head. Not using your head. It's very important to understand. Matthew chapter 20, turn that with me, please. Matthew chapter 20, look at verse 20 to 28. We're talking about a servant's heart. Matthew chapter 20. I read in your hearing, Matthew chapter 20. In verse 20, it reads, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these two my sons may sit, the one on thy right hand, and the other on the left in thy kingdom. Verse 22. But Jesus answered and said, ye, ye know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said unto him, We are able. And he said unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them from whom it is prepared of my Father. Verse 24. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with what? And against the two brethren. You're going down. But Jesus Christ called them and said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your what? And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. I'm quite sure we get the import of these scriptures. Jesus came to serve in order to set men free, to be the people God created them to be, because we've been hearing that we are in bondage to sin. See, greatness is defined by servanthood, according to Matthew 23, 10. Greatness. We realize that greatness in God's kingdom is never to be understood, never to be what? Found in position or power or in what? In opinions of men. Kind of straighten that out. But in servant-like service to others. Position only give you responsibility. Titles, they're not what God is looking for, whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, a chief, or a bottle maker. It's very important to understand that. The very thoughts of God were clothed in flesh and blood, love with skin on it. Matthew 123. So what the world not only needs a proclamation of the truth, but they need to see a demonstration of the truth. Children do not learn what they hear. They learn what they see. Are you with me? You can proclaim, as it was said, that we can have information but no understanding. We can become dispensers of truth but not sustainable. Do you understand what I'm saying? That we can sit, I can stand up here and give you lectures, lecture on health, 
just dispensing information. And for probably maybe a two weeks, you grab this information and run for two weeks. You done clean the plate off of everything. You got faces, mothers, and lips. You threw out the sugar cane, sugar uh, container. You're running for two weeks. Then after two weeks over with, you go right back. Hmm? I can show you all ugly pictures of a cancer liver and, and, and rat drops uh, dropping on the, on the chocolate and chocolate rat turds. I can show you all those pictures, frighten you. I know I did that with my family. I frightened them into the health message for two weeks. <laughs> Dispensers of truth. Christ is the center of every message. If Christ is not in the health message, there's no power to sustain them. Every truth must have Christ in the center of that truth. How to develop a servant heart. It says here, learning from, it says here from Jesus, learning can you straighten out a little bit so, so I can see that? Read that. Straighten it out a little bit. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Just a little more. But it says here, it's all right. Just pull it. Mm. Learning to live as a servant. We can go with that. Learning to live as a servant naturally begins by following the Lord Jesus Christ because he was the epitome of servanthood. It says here, as believers who what? who are to follow in his steps of our Savior, it is important that we focus on him because he was and is the epitome of humility, maturity, and leadership. That which most uniquely characterized him was servanthood. Servanthood. Even now, though seated at the right hand of the Father as the glorified Lord, he continues to minister to us as our advocate, intercessor, and head of the body, and, 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 and the head of the body of Christ. This is tremendously significant, especially in the light of who he was and is. What this is in mind, let us review the following truth. Though being God, very God, he humbled himself but become true humanity. That's a great condescension, God becoming human. Hmm? It goes on and says here, and was found in the form of a bond servant, Philippians 2, 5, 8, and God highly exalted him, verse 9. And then it goes on and says, the road to true servanthood is paved with the solid, what, concreteness of humble service for others even in the Old Testament, would anticipate the glories of the Messiah's kingdom. Messiah is seen as a suffering servant. Principle. Following the example of the Savior, believers are to function as servants who seek to minister to one another in loving and selfless service. Issue. Am I, it says, am I, what? in submission to the Lord and to others, seeking to serve, or am I seeking to be served in the pursuit of my wants? Servant. How to reveal the heart of Christ? How should we reveal Christ? I know no other better way than to take hold of the medical missionary work in connection to the ministry. It says the medical missionary work is the gospel illustrated. That means the gospel in living colors. It brings us in contact with suffering humanity. It says, we have come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of the medical missionary work. Not one. The world is a laser house filled with victims of both physical and spiritual disease. Everywhere people are perishing for the lack of of a knowledge of the truth that has been committed to us. The members of the church are in, are in need of awakening that they might realize their responsibility in parting these truths to other people. Every member, 
It says here, one of the greatest hindrance to service or servant living is the desire for what? For a form of exaltation, position, praise, prestige, and power. Hmm? It goes on and says, those who take, it says here, those who take the secular route, so typical of the world, and who exalt themselves will eventually be humble. They will not only eventually lose the very status they seek, but if they are believers, they will also lose the kingdom of heaven. Our greatness as disciples of Christ is determined by our what? Servant. That's our greatness. It goes on and says, it is not based on ability or personality. It is not based on how much we have or who we know. We are placed in the ranks of God's kingdom according to our life as a servant. Servant, keep this in mind. If we leave from here, from this camp meeting, praising the Lord for the information that has been dispensed to us, go home, back the way we came, we have lost the very blessings that God has given us. It goes on and says here, servanthood is the condition or state of being a servant to others. A ministry to others rather than the service of self. It means willingly give of oneself to minister for and to others to do whatever it takes to accomplish what is best for another person. However, when serving others and their needs, if the underlying motive and goal is some form of self-love, like the praises of others for the service rendered, then one service is what? It's hypocritical. This type of service is really aimed at serving selfish ends. Usually in the futile pursuit of personal significance through something like praise, power. That's why I brought out those three needs, significance. We find significance in the praises of folks. We hold them accountable for affirmation. Did you hear what I'm saying? If you're rendering service to an individual, they would never say thank you. If you're not in Christ, that would impact you emotionally. It would even deter you to give up. This is why if we're going to be a servant of Christ, the things that we've heard from this pulpit, Dr. Mark, Pastor Ron, self, you and I need to know who we are in Christ and our divine purpose on this earth. We were not placed here on this earth to be loved. Do you hear what I just said? This is a loveless world. You in a loveless world, you expect the world to love you. So therefore, you are expecting something from someone that cannot give you something. And now you have emotional distress. You even go into depression. God would equip you. He does not call the qualified. He call and qualify the call. When we are willing to surrender our choices and say, surrender, say, Lord, I cannot give you my heart. I give you consent to take this heart and make it like Jesus. We are placed in this world as a solution to a problem that God knew was going to exist. The world need a revelation of Jesus Christ. The world need to see among God's remnant church how we function among ourselves. When people come on a campus like this, whether it's meat ministry, they need to sense the presence of Jesus on that campus. Human relationship is one of the most challenging things in our lives, the contention, the conflict. You see, there's nothing wrong with having a difference of opinion. I have no problem with that. It's pride of opinion. 
is pride of opinion. Because when we have different opinion, we're seeking for truth, God will give us clarity because we will answer the prayer of Jesus in John 17. And it was Jesus' mission with those 12 men. He said in order for them to be successful in their mission, they must come in unity of feelings, thoughts, and action. Did you hear that? What was the three things they must come in unity with? Now, we understand thoughts and action, but what gets to me, they had to come in unity with feelings. Feelings. Did you understand they must come in unity with feelings? Does anybody understand briefly what that means for God's people to come in unity with feelings? Now, up here, we gave a message. Different individual. I believe we're on the same page. Understand that? Action. You know, we, we believe in the reforms, et cetera, et cetera. But what I had to study, what is meant by coming in unity with feelings, with knowledge, with feelings, with Dr. Mark, with feelings, with Ron Lee, with feelings. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's dealing with your emotion. Now, I've been married 50 years, and the fact is the first couple of years was not what God had it to be until he had to take this old stony heart of mine and give me a heart of flesh. And so, therefore, I remember a situation with my wife. We, 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 we lost a child. We, we lost a child early in the days. Um, it was in the truth and wanted to have a home birth and et cetera, et cetera. I very seldom talk about that. And I remember when she was examining everything supposed to be, the placenta, everything supposed to be clean. And we went to bed that night, and I heard my wife, she started screaming with excruciating pain. It was about 12 o'clock at night. And she was in horrible pain. I felt the pain that she was experiencing. They did not do a clean job removing that aborted fetus. When I carried her to the toilet, she had to release all of that blood. Everything came out of her. It was like going through a whole second birth experience. You can feel the pain. You can enter into that pain. To be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, Christ vicariously projected himself into our experience. When we suffer, he suffers. Are you with me? When one member suffers, they all suffer. That's what it means. When you can feel the pain, it does not move you to what you call sympathy, which is all right. Sympathy is saying, I'm sorry, I'm praying for you. But it moves you to empathy. That empathy moves you with compassion. You seek what you can do to serve that person in that experience. You understand that? God want to bring us to that place. He says here, Christ, what did he do? Plan and that which produce maximum blessing to be what? And the church, let me get over here because so, you're not reading it with me. Christ plan and that which produce maximum blessing to the world. And the church is servanthood. A servant who even when in position of leadership seeks to lead and influence others through lives given in ministry for the blessing of others and their needs. The Lord Jesus came as a servant with a commitment to serve. Huh? It says, what? Just think. If he had come to be served, our redemption would and would never have, been, have taken place. Likewise, our failure to live as, live as servant throws up a huge barrier to effective ministry as representative of Jesus Christ. Naturally, it says, natural, the model for mature spiritual, spirituality and leadership and all Christian living is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is instructed to note that in this context of serving, he spoke of himself as a son of man. He identified the humanity. This was a favorite designation of him. One use some 90 times, you see through the scriptures, 90 times, missing title based on mission, but it's also stressed his preeminence, dignity, and authority. He came to serve 
in order to set men free. He humbled himself. Individuals engaged in some form of volunteer service are healthier and live longer. Did you know that? It goes on and says here, you grow by serving. You impart knowledge and you will retain knowledge. Self-centered people are most miserable people. You resist evil by aggressive service. It is God, it says his God ordained methods to develop Christ-like character through servitude. Many of us don't see the fruit of our training because we don't share the knowledge. Further, it says here, we think it is time consuming to serve others. You gain most by serving others. It's not time consuming. Serving. God said, you are my witness. If we are, grow, if we are to grow in Christ's likeness, we must be willing to empty ourselves or ask God to empty us, to hold back nothing. We must, we must be about, we get about polishing our image. What does it mean to polish your image? Huh? Well, we got to look good. We got to make sure we have a good presentation. We got to have everything intact, have all the hairs lined up, all the message just right. Polishing your image. Holding nothing back, saving face, or making sure that we look Christian enough. To grow in Christ likeness means to empty, be empty of any and everything that would hinder a servant heart. Here are there are more than 75 halls of fame. I mean 750. Wow, thank you. 750 <laughs> halls of fame in America. It says that more than 450, who's who? You're all familiar with that, right? Publication. But you do not find many real servants in these places. Notoriety means nothing to real servants because they know the difference between prominence and significance. You have several prominent features on your body that you could live without. It is the hidden parts of your body that are indispensable. The same is true in the body of Christ. The most significant servant is often the service that is not seen. Cleaning the toilets, sweeping the floor, into the garbage. Hello out there. Hmm? It says here, in heaven, God is going to openly reward some of the most obscure and unknown servants. People, we never, what, heard of on earth who taught emotionally disturbed children, clean up after incontinent elderly, nurse AIDS patient, served in thousands of other unnoticed ways. Hmm? 1 Corinthians 15, 58 tells us that. Dwight L. Moody states, God sends no one away empty except those who are full of themselves. It's like a suitcase. If anybody have a wife, anybody who is full-time self-supporting, anytime you are called to leave these shores and go to a foreign country, especially to third world country, you do not take five suitcases. I remember nine. I think we was in um, Zambia. And it was there when Whitney Phipps was there. Definitely, I know they're singing, but I, I saw his suitcase. It was only several weeks. One suitcase. Well packed organized, et cetera. Even his suit was in the suitcase. I said, what kind of suit you got, man? I put mine in the suitcase. It's going to have thousands of wrinkles. So he told me, pack. So I remember one trip to Thailand. We had three or four suitcases, precious, my precious wife. I'm not picking on her. I think she's still here. You still here, dear? 
Okay. Uh, I better clean it up a little bit. But I mentioned before that I'm 6'6", six, six, and those folks over there is 4'3". And the door jam is 5'6". And as I'm carrying those suitcases, getting ready to go into the room, I lifted my head and knocked myself out to Joe Jam. Suitcase loaded, packed. It's embarrassing. You get to the airport and it's overweight. You got to stand there unfolded with all those folks standing around you. I learned my lesson after 45 years. So God says, what's in your suitcase? Pride, self-ambition, jealousy, unforgiveness, hatred, argumentative. We find temper tantrums, huh? all-consuming yet never satisfied once, small-minded and lopsided pursuits. That's in your suitcase. So God want to empty that suitcase, folks. He cannot put something in where it's full. So he want to empty that suitcase and fill it with the very fruit of Jesus' spirit, with love and joy, peace. You got long-suffering, kindness, and patience, and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, even self-control. You know, the health message is the fruit of the spirit. That's why they got to be sustainable. You can teach these principles of health, and there's no power for them to maintain that journey. So I want to be empty so God can fill. What about you? So in conclusion, I have just one question. What's in your suitcase? Hmm? Have you become empty that God might fill you with Christ's likeness and a servant heart? When we leave from here, we got to understand, Lord, search this heart. Know this thought. See, is there any wickedness in me? Enter me. Lead me in the path of righteousness. There is power in one person. One person can change the world. Did you hear what I just said? Do we have evidence of that? Well, Jesus is the epitome of that. Noah, one man. What do you think about that? We're going down. Joseph, hello out there. Moses, we go to Elijah. We're going down to the apostles. Paul, one person, Jesus Christ himself. Aren't you glad that God did not send a committee to save you? He didn't come up with a committee. One person working in harmony with God can impact the world for eternity. Now, say you got probably maybe about 100 people in this room. Say 100, less. God chose 12 people. And Judas was part of that. And God entrusted him with power. From that 12, it went to 120. You remember that? Now do the math. 12 times 10. We are told that one person working the right line with Christ can do the work of 10 persons. So if you take just take 10% of the people in here out of 100, you got 10 people. 10 times 10, that's 100. From there, you take one out of every 10, you can multiply that 10 times 100. You got what? 10 times, 10 times. So if you make yourself a committee to touch 10 people for the Lord, leave this place, consecrate yourself to God. Ask God to just give you a heart like his heart. Ask God to show you your purpose, to affirm who you are, because Calvary already done that. Leave this camp meeting with intentional living. How many know 10 people? How many know 10 people? Hello? How many know 10 people that you can begin to minister to? Do you know 10 people? Come on, talk to me. Don't don't be scared of their faces. You got 10 people in your family who don't know the Lord. No books, tools, but you want to make yourself a committee of one person. If God spare your lives, my life, we come back 2023. The testimonies, we will not have time to hold it. But if you go back 
and sit still, you're going to become stagnant. And stagnant water breathes death. You got to be a servant. Is that easy to do? Ten people. Ten people. Ten people. Begin to learn how to study the life of Christ. Humble, humility. Christ humbled himself. That's all it said. Who is called? Who is called? It said true education is missionary training. Every son and daughter of God is what? Call. Call. We are called to the service of God and, fo- and our fellow men. And to fit us for this service should be the object of our education. Hello. It says, everyone who becomes a partaker of his grace, the Lord appoints a work for others. Individually, we are to stand in our lot and place saying, here I am, send me. Upon the minister of the word, the missionary nurse, the Christian physician, the individual Christian, whether he be merchant, farmer, professional man, or mechanic, the responsibility rests upon all. That includes everybody, folk. It's our work to reveal to men the gospel of their salvation. Every enterprise in which we engage should be a means to this end. In the days of Christ, there was no sanitarian in the Holy Land, but wherever he what went, he himself was a sanitarian. Ramon went to Tabaka House, a walking sanitarian. Did y'all see that? That's a walking sanitarian. It goes on, it says here, the great physician carried with him the healing efficacy that was a cure for every disease, spiritual, physical. This he imparted to those who were under the afflicting power of the enemy, healing their disease and infirmity. That means you don't have to have an institution. When I started 45 years ago, we didn't have an institution at all. Either I brought somebody into my house or I went to their house. I remember my first case was appendicitis. The dear sister was examined, and they wanted to remove her appendix. She declined that movement, came to one of my mentor, but he was not in a position. And they said, if that appendix is not removed, it will kill her. And I was young in the faith. At that time, they didn't have cell phones. They have telephone booth. Keep quarters. And so on, we took the young lady home. My mentor gave some instruction. When I needed some help, I kept quarters in my pocket. I called him. He says nothing happened within three days. She got to get a surgical procedure. And I tell you, we went to work, my wife and I, that this sister still have an appendix today and work for the Lord. I remember next, my second case was a cancer case. Met a gentleman in the helpful store was a close friend of ours. He had a friend that had cancer. They sent him home to die. He was in bed. At that time, my son and I was working. Went to his home. Again, had quarters in my pocket. Called the mentor. What you do? Et cetera. The guy couldn't get up. He had bed sores. He had no bowel movements. We put on gloves. We cleaned his rectum out. We pulled the feces out of his rectum. We carry him to the tub. We heal. I mean, we got the bed sores. And his main burden was his son. He wanted his son to be saved. We work with that man. He rose up. He rose up. Son came to his bed and gave his heart to the Lord. We realized that a walking sanitary. Hmm? What you know, share what you know. The pool of Bethesda. You know about the pool of Bethesda found in John 5, 2 and 4. Pool of Bethesda. It says, now there's at at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda. See that name, Bethesda, having five porches. And they lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, withered, 
waiting for the move, halt and wither, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever first, first, after the trouble of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease. Now, let me ask you a question as we're coming on to a close. Was that God's method for healing? Why you say no? That's what it says in the Bible. But what? Selfish, huh? Is there any word in there that lets you know that could not be God's healing? Whoever first, first, there were people laying in the pool, people were stepping on one another, pulling folks out, jumping in the pool. There was a water coming from, definitely from, from, a, from a, a waterfall, but it was, it was claimed to be something supernatural. But look at that word Bethesda, B-E-T-H-E-S-D-A. What does the word Beth mean in Greek? What's the word? House. Now look at this word here. S-D-A, Bethesda. Did y'all see that? I mean, y'all didn't get that, huh? Did you get that? S-D-A. Did y'all get that? We are to be the house of mercy. Not the pool of Bethesda. People need to be coming to us or we need to be going to them. Did y'all get that? Compassion, huh? Compassion. Christ method alone give true success in reaching the people. Four things. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy to them, ministered their needs, and won their confidence like we saw in the testimony of Tabitha. Then he bade them follow me. Usually it's our custom to give a Bible, one short Bible study, then we invite people to follow me. That is not successful ministry. Huh? Therefore, the Savior mingled with men as one desiring and good. He showed his sympathy for them. He ministered to their need. He won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. He socialized. He sympathized. He served. He saved. That's Christ's method alone. Huh? He associated that little place is under one of the house in the Thailand. He ministered to them. He showed compassion. Now, if my wife can lead people from the jungles of Papua New Guinea, anybody can lead people from the jungles of Papua New Guinea. <laughs> and then rejoice. Four step, socialize, sympathize, serve. One day confident, then follow me. Here's a closing statement. I read this 45 years ago. I want you to get this statement. I want to make sure I don't want to miss anything in this statement. It says here, now I want you to apply this to your life. Many are in obscurity. Did you get that? Many are in obscurity. That means darkness. Many are in obscurity. They have lost their bearings. They know not what course to pursue. Now, this, what I, this really perplexed me. Let the perplexed ones search out others who are in perplexity. I'm going to repeat that. Let the perplexed ones search out others who are in perplexity. Does that sound, sound like sound psychology to you? If I'm perplexed and confused, I am admonished to search out others who are in perplexity. Okay? Listen to what it says. Let the perplexed ones search out others who are in perplexity and speak to them. Words of hope and encouragement. Listen to this. When they begin to do this work, words of encouragement and hope, when they begin to do this work, the light of heaven will reveal to them the path that they should follow. By their words of consolation to the what? Afflicted. They themselves will be what? Consoled. By helping others, 
they, what? Sell would be helped out of their difficulties. Joy takes the place of sadness, gloomness. The heart filled with the spirit of God glows with warmth toward every fault. Well, every what? Every soul, every such a one is no longer in darkness for his what? Darkness as noonday. You can read that in Isaiah 58. Hmm? If you're perplexed about doing service for God, what are you going to do when you leave here? <laughs> oh, and then you don't have to find, they're all around you. They're in your home. Start there. It says here, by the way, faithful servants never retire. I just heard young folks says amen. What about the, are you 65 and over? Have mercy. <laughs> I thought you were still a teenager, Pat. Uh, I knew that. You know, my spiritual father, which really is your father, me. It says two things you would never find in the Bible. Two things. He's 91 years of age, going on 92, still a worker for the Lord. Two things you would never find in the Bible. Sunday keeping and retirement. So if you had a retirement age, you see, I shared with you one time, so your career is what you're paid for. Your calling is what you're made for. You don't retire from your calling. And for those of us who are 65 older, 74, 70, Psalm 71, verse 18. David says, Lord, when I'm old and gray hair, forsaken me not until I show your strength to this generation and the generation to come. That is my creed. Hmm? Every day I live as it's my last day, but I want to be sure I can look back and say, Lord, every day you connect me with a soul that need to be connected with Jesus. He has not failed me in these last seven years. Are you with me? That should be yours. Serve. Only servant will be sealed. We talked about the seal of God. No matter what you look at, only servant is going to be sealed. We got to arm ourselves with the same mind. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. A Christian must keep the faith, but not to himself. Not to himself. You are called. Will you not answer the gospel Medical missionary call. You have no room to escape now. It's been, it's been closed. So we're going to definitely have a call here because God want to call you because the mission is possible. Did you hear the cry? The essence of a Christian life is servanthood. You want to be part of the eternal kingdom? You might as well declare right now and answer the call. So Lord, here I am. Send me. How many want to answer that prayer to Jesus tonight? How many? And we want to ask for God's spirit, his grace to be upon us, that he will empower us to be a servant after Christ's heart. Amen? Let us pray. Our gracious, eternal Father in heaven, Lord, as Colonel Irvin discovered that most important aspect of a Christian life. As he walked upon the moon, made his return trip back to this earth, he realized that he was not a celebrity, but he was a servant to declare to the world of your glory and your goodness. And Father, you have commissioned us. You have ordained us. You created us. You redeemed us for one purpose, that we might reflect the heart of your Son. And the heart of Jesus was a heart of a servant. So, Father, we declare that we want to be your servants. Now, Father, qualify us, sanctify us, strengthen us. If there's anything in these hearts of ours that is interfering us being servants like Christ, Lord, we give you permission to empty us of everything that's unlike you and fill us with the very fruit of your spirit. 
Lord, I pray when we lay down tonight, words that we receive from the morning to now, that has convicted our hearts, convicted us of sin and righteousness and judgment. And as we poured out our hearts to you through confession and repentance, that our sins might be forgiven and blotted out, and our names remain in the Lamb Book of Life. Let our sleep be refreshing. Let your angel encamp about every dwelling place. Let our thoughts be replaced with your thoughts, that we might be regenerated. According to your will, we might come forth in the morning as we enter to the last phase of this camp meeting. So, Father, I pray that each one of us will go from this place with intentional living to be a servant, to touch one to ten souls for the kingdom of heaven and to use the resources that we all have because we're not one of us can do this work alone. And we thank you for this. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God be the glory.